Well, happy Saturday, everybody. Glad you could join us. This is Bumper to Bumper Radio, and I am Dave Riccio, here along with my good friend Matt Allen. And we're here every Saturday to help you with your car from 11 to noon right here on News Talk 92.3 KTAR. At Bumper to Bumper Radio, we're helping you, the motoring public, have a better overall car experience. If you've got questions, we've got answers, and all you got to do for answers is give us a call at 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTR. We hope you're not shy. Today on the Bumper to Bumper Roadmap, what's leaking from my car, open phones, how to communicate with your auto shop, and who really pays more for auto repair, men or women? And I think women think women pay more. What do you think, Matt? I think they all pay the same if you're at the right shop. Everybody's everybody's equal. Everybody's equal. Well, according to the Detroit News uh, and and who is it? Northwestern University's Kellogg School of Management, they did a study where they shopped around. They 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 called around, which I think is a flawed prob the a flaw in the whole system in the first place is calling around to get a price. But they had a specific car. They used scripts. And uh, so it was a 2003 Toyota Camry, and they called around getting prices for a radiator replacement. In some cases, they already had a predetermined price, what they thought the price should be. And I believe they gave an indication over the phone of what the price should be or what they thought it should be, and the price was always closer. When they didn't mention the price, the price was always higher. So, what was the finding? Was it men or women who pay more for auto repair? Well, they say women, but I, I don't... I, Maybe I'm a little bit naive, but that's not something we do at our shop. So I don't. I just can't wrap my hand, my head around the whole. You know, you pay more because you don't know more this or that. And and I got to tell you, there's just as many, if not more, men that don't know anything about car repair than there is women. And I hate to even have this men win women conversation. There's some people that beat it up way too much. Well, and- I would totally disagree with the article, the way the way I read it. And the article, in my mind, contradicted it itself. So women, men were quoted the same price, whether they spat it out a price they thought it should be or not. But when women said, well, you know, the radiator, you know, I've gotten quotes for 365, then the, then the price came down. I think the phone is a flawed thing, but I think women are better shoppers when it comes to auto repair because they ask good questions. You know, women have a spider sense. You know, my wife knows things. I don't know how she knows, but she knows. It's the PI she's got following you. <laughs> right. <laughs> so women have a spider sense, and they, they, they have good intuition, and they know when to ask questions. And I find that men, on the other end, are embarrassed to ask questions because they don't want to be intimidated. They come the in macho a, side. The dude. macho side want... doesn't want to be in the weaker role, so they won't ask questions. They'll pretend they know what they're talking about or... Act, you know, it's assumed. Well, the other thing I thought was funny is more than one in three women got repair shops to meet their requested price compared to one in four men. They were able to negotiate. I think that's kind of, uh, you know, batting the eyes at the old gas station. Should <laughs> <Girl. laughs> Well, I, I, I tend to think women do get a better price. And in, in, in my shop, I feel like, you know, we kind of, the guys that work there kind of have a big brother kind of mentality. You know, they've, they've got this lady in here, and, and, you know, she doesn't really feel comfortable about being there. And can we look out for her? You know, and, and I don't know if that's I don't know if that's fair, but I think that's a little bit of the, some man instinct. It's not, hey, we're going to take, take well, advantage it's, it's of this lady. Big brother, she's a, big brother instinct or the father instinct. You want to take care well, of that? Well, I think about it. That. What if this was my wife? You know, what if I wasn't around and I wasn't able to take the car in? I would want somebody to treat her fairly. So that comes across, and I want to make sure she's getting a fair deal, not because she knows or has the right questions, just as she use her senses. But what makes it a fair deal, a better job or a better price? I mean, we talk about the price. I mean, I said the phone shopping thing is flawed from the get-go is what gets this study. It makes me discount it a bit because you get phone shopping all the time, and you, you someone over the phone might give you a lower price because they want to get your car out of the shop that it's in now and get it in, or they just, they're just they going to lure you in on the bait and switch or only tell you part of the problem. Well, you brought up before the show. Cars in a dealership or dealership auto shop, they say, hey, it's going to be $1,000 to replace your timing belt. It's 90,000 miles. It's due. Hey, honey, they want $1,000 to put a timing belt in my car. Oh, that's way too much. we got to call around. Well, they get off the phone. They call another auto shop, and they go, oh, yeah, we got timing belts starting at 395 Oh, wow, man. Those, they call back. 
man, you're ripping me off. A thousand bucks, I can get it done for three hundred and ninety-five dollars. Well, guess what? When that happens, when they get to that other shop. Well, let's do the water pump now. Let's do the timing belt tensioners. Let's go ahead and do those cam plug seals, you know. And it's $1,000. So all we did was waste, waste a day's worth of time. And I don't know what a day's time was worth to you, Matt, but I don't want to mess with it for, for the same thing. We all have the same economic engine. Is there huge price variations between shop A and shop B? Maybe that's what, what I'm wondering. Well, one doesn't include sales tax. And maybe on this Toyota that they use for an example, the, the overestimated market price... Uh, was five ten, and the real market price was three sixty five. What flavor rate is it? Was it a was it a Big Mac, or did they get the Durant's hamburger, or the Fuddruckers, or whatever? Well, you the, were on it. You were on a website just before the show, looking up that same repair. And what did the website say the price of that radiator should be? This was a two thousand three uh, well, Toyota Camry. Their price range is three hundred and seventy one dollars to five hundred and thirty, and that's using the radio station zip code here. But there's many variables there. Are you going to include is the shop using universal coolant? Or are they using the original Toyota proper coolant that you're supposed to have in there? Are they putting on new hoses? What if, the one estimate doesn't even include a radiator cap. So you're going to tell me the radiator was old enough and bad enough to fail. You're going to install a new radiator, but you're not going to put a radiator cap on it, and that's not part of the estimate? Come on. The other thing I would argue, if there's a problem, how well is it going to be taken care of? These are questions in my mind I think should be asked is, am I dealing with a quality shop? Are they going to do a quality job? If I'm talking over the phone, am I asking them, how long have your technicians been working for you? How long have you been in business? Are you a member down at the BBB? How is your complaint record look like? You know, there's more to it than just what is the price. And I think we don't, we do as consumers want to be in the know. We don't want to just pay some ridiculous price, but I don't know that how often do you hear someone just getting soaked, Matt, on an auto repair? None. From from a, I don't know, 20th century auto shot. I mean, <laughs> they don't. And I think when you say get soaked, it's not a price thing. I think more people are, quote, say, ripped off by incompetence more than mm. they are by price. So that's why we always go back to, and Dave and I always talk about this, the relationship with your shop. Don't go shop to shop to shop to shop. Find somebody that you can stick with and 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 let them help you with everything that you need. Now that's now like at my shop, we don't do body work, but we use Kevin and I seventeen collisions. We've been using the guy for fifteen years, eighteen years. That's just who we use. So no, we can't solve all your problems and no we don't do everything, but we're your go to guy. So you need to find one of the, a shop that's like that. So in my I- opinion. So whether a radiator and this particular repair, as a consumer, is $400 or $500, do I believe that the shop's charging me $100 too much? Should I believe that? Is that, a, is that an accurate statement? No. No? I don't no, know. No, I don't think so. I mean, it's just, it's just different. There's different. It's a different price. It's, maybe it's not the same Apple. I was reading online this morning that a good question to ask is, what is your hourly rate? Is that a good question to ask? No, I think it's I think it's maybe something you might want to know, but you know we don't necessarily sell things by the hour. Most shops, I mean, it it comes into play. It's a price to get a job done. Check with your air conditioning contractor. There's no hourly rate, but there there's certainly a cost to that labor. But I use the example: if I'm ten dollars an hour more than the guy down the street, or vice versa, and I charge. And we don't even. I hate to even go down this road, but I charge an hour and a half, and he charges two hours. Well, what's the difference now? Did you save any money? No. It 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 kind of doesn't matter. Well, it's I think like the, the f- thinking is that, that that's going to be an indicator of your overall cost of your service based on your hourly rate. In other words, I can take that broad brush and paint it across all your service because I know you're $100 and then the guy down the street's $98. If you take the average repair shop repair order, it's two to three hours worth of work. So whether one guy's 95 and one guy's 105 that's a twenty dollar difference. It's not worth twenty bucks is not worth making the decision over who fixes your car. Well, a lot of times you can certainly shop around and maybe get your car fixed cheaper, but is it better? Well, and it's the same. There's, I, well, Dave and I looked at this too, and, and maybe the by definition it's not right, but there's cheap and there's inexpensive, and those are two different things in my book. That you can get something cheap and you can get something less expensive. Cheap is to me of a low quality. And inexpensive is just a lower price. But, Dave, it's the free diagnosis thing. I met with a guy a couple weeks ago, 
in Kansas City, and he says, oh, yeah, we show no diagnosis. We don't charge any diagnosis on the repair order. I said, well, how can you do that? Oh, well, we just charge more for the repair. Mm. No. Yeah, there's nothing free. Right. And that's, can... to me, that's just dishonest. I don't like it. It's still a big expense. So when we come back, we've got open lines at 602-277-5827. Don't be shy. 602-277-KTR. You're listening to Bumper to Bumper Radio. Welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I'm Matt Allen along with Dave Riccio. And today we are talking about who pays more for car repair, men or women. According to uh, the Detroit Free Press or Detroit News, something or other, they did a survey and they say women, but I'm not buying it. I totally disagree. I think the I think the test was flawed because you can't. Nothing really happens over the phone. We're not looking at the car, and we do have a a, a range of choices as to how to repair or approach a job. There's there's ten different ways to to make one repair. Something, something just popped into my head, Dave. Oh no! Online dating. Now I've never been there, but I have some friends, and I tell you <laughs> what, I bet you you know you do the old online thing, and whoops, it's a little different when you get there, maybe. So. <laughs> Don't. <laughs> Is that how you fooled Edith? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, oh boy, I won't say their names, but <laughs> but uh, I know some people. So, uh, well, uh, we've got up for a segment. We've got David, and he's calling on topic. What do you got for us, David? You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Yeah. Hey guys, I had a question. You know, about six months ago, my uh, fuel pump went out in my Chevy Silverado, just a single cab short bed. And I got a quote from the guy, and I felt like it was really high. Uh, and I said, what, what's the major cost on that? And he said, well, the labor's about, you know, three and a half hours. I mean, it was a while ago. I don't remember. I was using an arbitrary number. But he said it's about three and a half hours. And I, and I said, well, you know, it's six bolts to take my truck bed off and replace it. And so that's what I, I ended up doing it myself. It took about 45 minutes. And I said, so why do you charge, you know, three hours of labor? And basically, he said, "Well, that's what the manufacturers say, so that it's going to cost to drop the tank and all that kind of stuff." And I said, "Well, that's a little dishonest." And he said, "Well, that's just one of the tricks of the trade." Is that common? Um, you know, for shops to do that, that basically, even if they find a, a a more efficient way to to make a repair, to to basically still charge whatever the manufacturer says it should. Well, I think there's a there's a difference. I mean, there it may be common, yes, but there's an there's an argument there. It's I'm sure, I mean, if you did it in 25 minutes, I'm hiring. Right, because right. Because hey. it's not just 6 bolts, it's 6 bolts to undo the bed. Half the time the cars have stuff in the bed that you've got to take out. Then it takes 3 guys to lift the bed off the back of the truck to do it. You've got to remember to um to you know, unplug the taillight harnesses, then clean all the dirt off of the top of the fuel tank. Yeah, the the labor guide probably does say you remove the fuel tank, and that's a way to do it. This was something but, that came up for a vote not long ago, and and it was, hey, does the shop charge what the actual time is or what the book says? And they wanted to make a lot, and it didn't go anywhere because it was it was really, although it was supposed to be pro consumer, I think it was anti consumer uh, because it didn't really didn't really work. It's just a guide, and to be honest with you, I don't I don't necessarily believe book times, but we have to have some form to measure to justify not justify, but no, hey, what do you charge for the job? You know, we can look at a a Toyota. Camry, and it'll say it's 11 hours to r and the transmission. Well, I've got a front-wheel drive Chevrolet right next to it. Pretty much the same amount of work, that one calls for seven hours. So is it more expensive to fix the Toyota because it costs 11 hours? I mean, the guide is different. So do we follow the guide? Do we go by our own price? But we just have to have some sort of measure to be consistent in our pricing. Well, in, 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 in some cases, there, where there's a gross, I mean, it's just off. Way off, in, yeah. in, in shops, I know we make adjustments. That it can't. I mean, we look at our time afterwards and go, that, that's just ridiculous. But then there's another case where if, if my technician or I invest, let's just say, $1,000 in this special tool that helps us cut the repair time in this by 40%. Who's supposed to benefit from that? We made the investment of the thousand dollars, so it, you've got to look at the value you received as well. Well, in, in my shop, I think some of that does go back to the customer, it but does. at the same point, some of it does go toward the purchase of that tool. 
So that, you know, and when the tool's new, you got to pay for it. As time goes on, it's already been paid for. And then the second part of that is when the book time calls for three hours and it takes us five and we get the proverbial, got the bus parked on top of us or we're under the bus, we don't get to call you back. <laughs> and ask for and, more. And ask for more. And I say, I think you get your your benefit. And it's, again, it goes back to having the relationship, the relationship. You get your value over a long time time of having that relationship you can't or shouldn't look at it on a repair by repair by repair basis and if you're at one shop having most of your work done i think there's give and take both ways yeah no that's a great question dave and i think i think it's one that a lot of consumers really think about what is this book what is this labor guide you know we had to we do so much of the same similar work but between brands we just standardized on what we thought reality was and that's an internal figure that we use for how long we think a job should should take and what it should cost so great question let's go up next with greta in phoenix on a 2004 nissan altima go ahead greta you're on bumper to bumper radio hi i just recently in the last three, four months, had lots of work done on my car, such as um, it started out because it, I was having a hard time getting it started. So I, they started out repairing the starter, went to the alternator, then the water pump, also got the brakes and, and a rotor fix, a full pump, then the air conditioner hose was rebuilt, then the crankshaft sensor was replaced. About nine months before that, the rack and pinion was replaced. Now the car won't start at all. It'll try to crank over, but it doesn't start at all. There is 190,000 miles on the car, so it's really done me good. But at this point, I'm trying to figure out what do I do (laughs) Well, I'm ha- hearing that maybe it's the computer, the wires are electrical. Has the shop that did one shop do all of that work? <laughs> all except the crank, the crank cam sensor. Okay. Was well, this was this all in one business, or was this over the course of a two years? No, this the first the, the only thing that happened about nine months ago was a rack and pinion. Everything else was in the last three to four months. Well, I think, one, we need to get it back to the shop that did, that's did that been doing these repairs. And it's a good thing, I think, that, that you've been with that shop and take it back to them and have them do the diagnosis and do the testing on the car and find out what's going on with it. Dave, there, there's a – over three months she had a lot of stuff done. And sometimes some shops get beat up or say, oh, you gave me the list. I got the list. And and I think it's our job as professionals when we start looking at those cars that we need to, if 190,000 mile car, we're not just going to dribble a repair a week or a repair every two weeks. I think as a, as a, I don't think I know, or my opinion, as a shop owner, <laughs> I don't know what I know now, but... <laughs> We, as a technician, as an owner, we're all obligated to look at that car and give them the whole big picture of everything that's happening. Now, you can't predict when an alternator is going to no, fail or, or some weird problem. But but up front, go find everything that's wrong with the, wrong with the car because that'll say, hey, I've got 190,000 miles in my car. How much more money am I going to invest in it? Am I going to put the three to $5,000 in it to drive this thing for another three years or five years? Where am I at? So you don't want just... People that sell you the easy stuff as you come in the door. Oh, you need this. You know, that's something we can sell. The list, believe it or not, that guy's being more honest and straightforward with you, saying these are all the things you need, you know, that could be coming up in your near future. So when we come back, we've got open lines at 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTR. You're listening to Bumper to Bumper Radio. My pappy said, son, you're going to drive me to drinking if you don't stop driving that hot rod Lincoln. Bumper to Bumper on News Talk 92.3 KTAR. Well, welcome to back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio here along with Matt Allen, and we are talking about your car. We're talking about what auto repairs should cost. Should women pay more? Do men pay more? Who pays more for auto repair? And uh, it's, it's a topic that's on everybody's mind. With talking cars today, I do want to take a moment to acknowledge the firefighters from Yarnell. And uh, we put on our Facebook page a link 
to is it Yarnell Firefighters Fallen Yarnell Firefighters? No, it's YarnellFirefighters.com, and that in conjunction with the United Phoenix Firefighters Association and the Prescott Firefighters Charities is a good safe place to go if you want to make a donation to help those families. You've got to watch. I mean, it's it's not a happy time for a lot of people, especially up there in Yarnell and Prescott area. And you've got to watch where you want to direct your your money to. There's you've got to be careful of some people that are scamming and making phone calls. I don't think making a donation to somebody that's calling you. From what I understand, these charities do not make outbound calls looking for money. And so we've posted that link on our Facebook page at bumper to bumper radio dot com, and it's a good safe place to go. Well, as well as money tonight too. When you're saying your prayers, uh, just lift up the families. Uh, of the firefighters. The other thing I think it does for me is really appreciate more what I have and, you know, hug my wife and children a little harder when I come home every day. So let's not, let's not, not learn something from this. And uh, anyway, well, up for this segment, we've got Vin from Phoenix on a 2008 Chrysler 300. Go ahead, Vin. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Uh, good morning, Matt and Dave. How are you? Great. Good. Thank you. Hey, the wife and I are considering purchasing a uh, treater uh, warranty on a on our Chrysler 300. It has 85,000 miles on it. It's a 5.7 Hemi uh, with all-wheel drive. Um, what's your thoughts on that? I need your professional opinion on these warranties. I'm a little skeptical. I've seen some of the warranties do very do a very good job of covering a lot of things, and it's okay. and you've got to look at it like it's a uh, like it's um, it's not a warranty. It's an insurance policy. And look at it like health insurance. There's going to be a lot of things that are covered. There's going to be a lot of things that aren't covered. And the reality is when they sell that, they sell you something. Everything's covered. It's all taken care of. There isn't one of those policies. They don't cover. There isn't one that covers everything. But besides that, there's the type of policies, policies that exclude or they include. And I would always want to have the policy that gives you a list of what is not covered as opposed to what is covered. Because if it, it whatever it is, is not on that list, it is not covered, even if it's not down to the T. And then you've got to watch oil change times. There's a lot of dots to I's to dot and T's to cross. Well, there's there's good ones and there's bad ones. There's a lot of fly-by-night ones where, to, in my mind, they feel a little bit like a Ponzi scheme. When I call for a customer who has one and I call them, they go, nope, not covered. Nope, we don't pay that. Nope, we don't pay that. And maybe that's the math and that's the way the thing – but the impression is that, oh, this is a great deal. A lot of times there's, you know, sometimes they'll break it down to uh, bronze, gold, platinum coverage. And you got to look at that and see what is covered. What I don't like is the ones with the LKQ clause. So your transmission goes out at 90,000 miles. So LKQ is like, kind, and quality. So all they're really responsible to pay for is to put a transmission in with 90,000 miles Otherwise, they would consider it betterment. So that one's frustrating because let's just say you have a transmission that has an average life of 90,000 miles. You're going to go me another one with 90,000 miles on it. So that's frustrating to me. And then sometimes, you know, they'll come out and they usually, in the transmission business, we see it a lot. So they, they ask us to pull the transmission out to point of failure, and the customer's responsible to pay that. We pull it out, and then they spend an ins- send an inspector out, and we say, hey, here's what failed, the 3-4 clutch drum. This is what's bad. Well, the inspector takes a look, and he goes, yep, you're right. He goes out, and he takes a picture of the tire size on the tires, and he takes a picture of the placard in the door. And if those two don't match up, they deny the claim. Yeah, they're always looking for excuses not to pay. But there are some that are good. And if you want to send us an email, at bump- go to bumper to bumperradiocom Go to the contact page, and I'll send you a, a link, or not a link, but some of the names that we have success with. But some of the ones I like, like Geico, for example. If you have your car insurance with Geico, they've got a good mechanical breakdown coverage. It's not a warranty on everything, but if you blow a radiator, they're going to cover the radiator. They're going to cover the related parts that parts and labor and coolant and, and clamps and stuff to do that job right. And that's also, by the way, a good place to get your road service. Yeah, right with your own insurance company. You have a relationship with them, so they're not going to do you wrong. They have more than just towing. You know, you've got your home with them. You've got your, you know, your cars with them, whatever you have with them. So I would say they can be a good thing, but they can also be a bad thing. So do your shop and send Matt that email. 
Let's go with Rose in Mesa on a 2007 Buick LaCrosse. Go ahead, Rose. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Yeah, a couple of weeks ago you spoke about putting the wrong kind of oil in your car. Quite by accident, I discovered that the dealer was putting in 12W30 instead of 5W30. What kind of damage would that have done? Probably, Rose, on on your car, nothing at all. And it was probably 10W30 that the dealership was putting in or the shop instead of 530. And, And I don't know how you came with that determination. We always will look at the oil cap. But then if you go into the owner's manual, there's sometimes quite a range of what oil can go in that car. It could be 530, it could be 1030. A lot of shops just have 1030, and that's what they that's their oil that covers everything. They, they pump it out of bulk, and it's one-fits-all kind of thing. And variation up or down, still close enough? Um, no, not always. Right. Definitely not always. It depends. I mean, it was close enough 15 or 20 years ago. Everything got 1030, but no. Now it's, it, we need to... Uh... Well, here's my concern on, on the GMs with this Dexos oil. And, you know, they're offering you know, a lot of times five-year, 100,000-mile powertrain warranties. They do want to see sufficient maintenance, and they do want to see that the right oil has been run in it. So would it do any damage to the car? I don't think so. No, but the time when you might see damage or, or have something happen to the detriment from using the wrong oil is if it's warm down here in the valley... Even in the wintertime, when I say wintertime warm here, and you put in 1030, and then you take that Tahoe Chevy truck, that Buick LaCrosse, take that up to Flagstaff or take it up to Utah where it's freezing cold. That oil does not flow the same way when it's cold, and you get noises. You can blow out an oil seal, but I doubt that you've had any problem. Just start using the 530, and I'm sure everything is fine. Hey, Rose, thanks so much for the call. We're going to go to Duwan in Mesa on a 1998 Dodge Avenger. Go ahead, Duwan. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hey, good to talk to you guys. What can we do for hey, you? Hi. Yeah, I got the, uh, a 98 Dodge Avenger. I bought it last year. It's it spent most of its life in the Midwest. Um, and my question is regards to the transmission fluid, about changing the fluid. I'm trying to do some preventative maintenance on it. The transmission, um, it, it runs good. Um, the car runs good. Um, I've heard some conflicting reports. You shouldn't flush the transmission fluid after, you know, so many years, or you should only drain it or, or vice versa. So I'm kind of looking for some advice as to how I go about just doing, like, a good, nice fluid change. It is, I mean, definitely an FAQ on this show. You know, should we, because there's so much bad information about transmission service, and a good majority of our marketplace doesn't understand a transmission. I I know ASC master technicians who have never really, you know, maybe they saw the inside of the transmission somewhere there in tech school, but they don't know how it works. So we have, we've got loop shops giving us one set of information. We've got transmission shops, another set of information. Just a whole plethora of information out there. The point is, If the transmission is good and solid and good shape, you definitely do want to stay up on service with good fluid in it. Where people have, have, I think this rumor has started, is when you take a transmission that has an issue and you service it, it will kill the transmission. So you want to be working with a shop that's going to drive the car ahead of time, make sure there's nothing wrong, scan it for codes, make sure we don't have any torque converter lockup issues or gear ratio errors or any of those things, and then I would recommend a service on the transmission. Consider the fluid that you're taking out of there first also. So if you're looking at the fluid and you pull out the dipstick and it's, you know, it should be a, a cherry red color if it's, you know, brand new, fresh out of the bottle. If it's been in there for 20, 30,000 miles, it's going to start to look faded red. But if you pull it out and it's black, mm, you might want to consult a transmission shop before you do a service on it. Well, Dave, we talk about flushes, and I think in the transmission world, I mean, the term flush is kind of like I'll have a Coke. I mean, it's Pepsi, maybe it's RC. We're not flushing the transmission. That's just a broad stroke term, and we're just changing the transmission fluid out. But you brought up a good thing about going to the transmission shop and, and having the transmission service, but don't come in with a problem and not tell us you have a problem. This is one of the things that Dave and I were going to talk about today, too, is communicating with the shop. We get people that come in, oh, I need to get a transmission flush. Why? Well, I just need one. Okay, well, what is happening? And they think we're giving them the third degree, and it's sometimes we, we are. We're trying to gather data so that we can provide you with a good service. And then it starts to come out that every once in a while it does a hiccup on the fourth Tuesday of the month, and this happens, and there's a slip. Well, 
they're trying to fix the car by having us do a transmission flush on it. Same, and the biggest time we see this is with cooling system flushes. I need a cooling flush. Why? I'm overheating. Nope, that's not fixing your problem. This is maintenance, not repair. Well, to my point, what I wanted to talk about, what is leaking from my car? We got a perfect example of this was that uh, we had a lady show up in our shop on Wednesday evening before the holiday, and she said, I've got uh, my transmission is leaking. You know, I just had the car all checked out, and they said everything was good, but now my transmission is leaking. I said, well, was the puddle like the size of, uh, you know, you know, a small, you know, breakfast bowl, or was it the size of, a, you know, one of those things you ride down the snow hill, you know? Was it a big puddle, you know, three feet wide? She said, oh, it was a real big puddle. So we said, okay, no problem. We'll get it checked out on Friday, and we'll, and we'll give you a call. Well, we looked at it, and these things don't leak the same color fluid you were used to. She had a coolant leak, engine coolant leak, and it was a Chevrolet Tahoe, and that is red, which looks like transmission fluid to a lot of people. If they didn't know, they changed the color of coolant. Or if you didn't touch it. Yeah, they, it's red coolant, and transmission fluid is red. But what's funny is the transmission was one quart over full, and she said, my son added a quart of transmission fluid. And when we smelled it, it didn't smell like regular transmission fluid that she added. It smelled like some sort of additive, like a stop leak. And this is where, you know, my concern is, is that we poured something into the transmission to fix a problem because we thought it was a transmission. We, being the customer, poured this miracle sauce in that doesn't do anything. So my, my concern is, okay, now we got to service the transmission to get that stuff out of there. I am not a proponent of stop leaks. It, 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 uh, you can take a small problem and make it a big issue. But the other thing I want to make people aware of is just because you can't look at the color anymore and tell what the heck it is. You know, just because it's red, the other thing that happens this time of year is that you get that puddle underneath the passenger seat. The puddle always shows up. It's dripping. Sometimes you feel it. Does it feel oily? I can't really tell, but it's cold. Well, that's condensation from your air condition. And, uh, you know, sometimes if that hose that goes down the floorboard gets gets knocked loose, it'll actually leak in the passenger floorboard. Well, this is the time of the year. With the humidity, that's one of the common things. We do the interview at the counter. That's why we ask these questions. And it's just this clear fluid leaking out, and we can go down and just bend down on take a knee, so to speak, and take a look. And people are prepared to drop off their car. They think they have a problem, and we can save you a lot of time, or you can even save yourself a lot of time. If you see that puddle, back the car up, feel it. Is the water cold still? Uh, is, is it a clear fluid? Does it happen every time you park? It's always that same clear fluid. Now, don't get... Don't just blow it off either and think that maybe you really don't have a problem. But chances are, if it just started happening with this humidity and you're using your air conditioning, it's the normal air conditioning condensation. A lot of times that's what it is. We've got Matt and Rick and probably room for one more at 602-277-5827. You're listening to Bumper to Bumper Radio. Well, welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio, here along with my good friend Matt Allen, and we are here helping you with your car. Every Saturday from 11 to noon right here on 92.3. And you can also reach us at BumperToBumperRadio.com. We take email questions there, as well as there's a list of great shops. We're talking about all this pricing and all this stuff that I don't really think you have to worry about if you're just working with a good shop. You know, I always want to take the stress out of auto repair, and uh, the best way not to be stressed with auto repair is just to know you're working with a good shop, know that you have a relationship. Relationship is give, give and take. Sometimes it works out better for you, sometimes not as good. You know, But you're looking at the relationship as a whole as opposed to, oh, man, they charged me 450 for that radiator. I got a price over the phone from 410 for somebody else, whatever. The price thing will drive you nuts as a consumer. This guy's got this warranty. This guy's got that warranty. You know, I, it, I just think it just adds a lot of stress to the whole situation. But, you know, we heard a commercial from Greg at Automotive Diagnostic. If I meet anyone who lives anywhere near that part of Chandler, I'm sending them there because I know his guys are competent. They charge fair and reasonable prices. And when you get what you pay for. I heard someone once tell me something unrelated to auto repairs. Once you've bought it, quit shopping for it. And I think it was in relation to a television or, or a computer or something It was something actually like your that. wife. <laughs> <laughs> quit. Sh- I don't know what to think of that, Dave. <laughs> I'm not sure where you were going, but where that was coming from. But it's always, uh, you know, Uncle Jethro or somebody has an opinion after. That's when we get the phone call sometimes. Oh, it was too much. Jethro told me. <laughs> Jethro hasn't put a radiator in 15 years. Got his driver's license taken away because he couldn't see over the wheel. <laughs> well, let's go with, looks like, Rick uh, on a 2008 Ford E250 van. Go ahead, Rick. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. 
thank you, gentlemen, for uh, taking my call this, this morning. Just a, uh, this van that I'm referring to is about 180,000 miles on it. I drove it to Tucson yesterday morning from Phoenix. About 100 miles I got out, went out to start it. It would not start. Um, I understand now I know about the, the I think it's the fuel pump reset and the kick panel on the passenger side. Is that correct? I don't know. What makes you think it's that? Well, it, I I reset that. It was in the owner's manual. I looked in the owner's manual. I reset it, and it started fine. Um, I got back on I-10 to head back to Phoenix, and it acted up one more time. I actually did that process twice, and I was able to get, to get, the, get the van back into town without having to have it towed. So when you reset that, you're actually hearing the, the – when you push the button, you can actually hear it click and reset, kind of like a GFI outlet? Yeah, that, okay. that, that's a good analogy, absolutely. I would not I – would, I would say that's not a common problem. We would typically see I, those failing – when I was in the towing business or had tow trucks, we would see cars get flat tires. And they would smack, you know, the, the tire delaminates and smacks the wheel well. Or somebody left a basketball in the trunk. <laughs> it's well, bouncing around back there. We've seen, yeah, seen. I wouldn't say a basketball maybe, but yeah, something heavy enough to bounce around and hit that switch. Now that thing's referred to as an inertia switch. Yes. And it's made so if the car gets in an impact, the car that shuts off the fuel so the thing doesn't turn into a Molotov cocktail. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but so that, that I'm sure if that's what you're doing, you're pushing that button, definitely I would start with putting a new one in. I, I'm not sure. If I haven't heard of one going bad. I mean, it's not pretty like rare. that. No, not and I, you could probably get them in the aftermarket. I'm not sure. I would probably just go to the dealer and get a get an original equipment one and put it in. But don't bypass it because you're, you if you did, you were bypassing a a big time safety item. For sure. Well, thanks for the call, Rick. Uh, and if you want to follow up at bumper to bumper radio dot com, more than welcome to send an email there. We're going to go with Matt in Santan on a 1996 Chevrolet Tahoe. Go ahead, Matt. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hey, guys. Thanks. Appreciate it. Um, like I said, I got this 96 Tahoe. It's got 167,000 miles on it. Um, and it wants to, when I first bought it a few months ago, it started real good. And then slowly it started. You've got to crank it at least about 10 seconds every time to get it to fire up. And then every now and again it will fire right off. I didn't know if that would be fuel pump or if that could be O2 sensors or well more likely I mean this is the time of year with the heat we see it more and we go through rashes of this same question and what you're probably having is a low fuel pressure issue you could have a fuel pressure regulator that has a ruptured diaphragm so the the engine is drawing raw fuel off the back side of the regulator and, you, and causing you to lose pressure because when you when you shut the car off that should hold dead head or hold the pressure of say 60 pounds or 45 pounds and then when you cycle the key it's going to jump it back up to up to 60 so well, when there, you crank it there's so initial prime when you turn the key forward it goes ee! you hear that noise he could cycle that a couple times to get that to see if it starts right up what one way to help diagnose that for the shop that you take it to would be to in the morning when that happens don't don't go start the car and let it crank for that 10 seconds turn the key on to the on position and let it sit for maybe three seconds. You might hear a fuel pump running. You might not. Let it sit. Cycle it back off to on. Off, on, off, on with a good pause in there. Do that three times and see if it starts up. Then if it fires right up, maybe you've got a fuel pump issue. But take that information to your shop and tell them all the symptoms. It's very important to when you're taking your car in and dropping it off, talking to the advisor, to let them know everything that's happening, how long it's happened, what you do to make it change its its uh, symptom. Let's sneak in Jerry in Mesa on a 2006 Chrysler Town & Country. Go ahead, Jerry. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Yeah, just a comment. Um, I, about oh, four oil changes ago, I take my car to the dealer, and I've been going there since I bought the car. And uh, they're changing the oil, and they come back and say, uh, you need an oil pan gasket. And I said, hmm, how much is that? $189. Oh, okay. I said, uh, not this trip, because uh, I've never seen a drop of oil in my driveway where I keep the car. And I go back the next time, 3,000 miles later, tell me the same thing. Um, last time I went for an oil change, they say nothing. They just change the oil and let it go. And I've never had a drop in my driveway. 
Well, well I think I think one of the biggest things that doesn't get communicated very well in the auto repair business is what's a leak and why are we changing the oil pan gasket. Now, if they're concerned about a leak, we in our shop at Tri City we rate leaks on a scale of one to five. It's kind of like a hurricane. Five would be really bad, and one is like there's not really a leak going on. A lot of times we see twos, where two is you know it's it's wet around the seal but oil has not hit the ground yet. So maybe they're seeing some of that and maybe that's why the recommendation. But when you know it's a two and not a five, the sense of urgency comes way down. Do I need to handle this or just monitor it in the future? And I think it's in a monitor situation if we're not seeing a leak on the ground. Well, and one of the other things too is you've got to remember these newer cars have shields all underneath the bottom side of the car to protect. They want to help keep them quiet. Uh, it helps with fuel efficiency. And, and a lot of times those shields will hold all that fluid. So that's a case of ask questions and ask them to show you. Remember, bumper to bumper radio.com if you're looking to start a relationship with a great shop. Next week, we've got Jason Crowlin, an oil chemist from Lab One here in town in studio. So if you've got any questions about oil, remember not to text and drive. We'll see you next week.